Before I worked at Google and CERN, I'm also an author of the book, Continuous Delivery, with Dr. Ann Jenkins. And from time to time, I do uh, conference speaking and trainings. And I live in Krakow, not, not far away. A few words about Hazelcast. So who of you has heard about Hazelcast? OK, so this is not, not bad. <laughs> uh, so we are a distributed company. In a, distributed in two meanings. One is distributed because we produce distributed software. And the second meaning is because our team is distributed aclo across the world. So we don't have one location. I work from Poland, another work from here. We have guys in Italy, we have guys in the US, everywhere. We are about, we are like, like small family, like engineers, there's around 40 of us. We have three products. The first one is Hazelcast, which you probably, uh, if you raised your hand, probably you know. It's like an in-memory data grid solution. Second one is Hazelcast Jet, which is a stream processing library. And the third one is Hazelcast Cloud, which is Hazelcast provided as a service. Our agenda for today is very simple. So there will be a very short introduction about caching in general. And then I will walk through all possible caching patterns, caching topologies that you can use inside your microservice system. And while I'm talking, I would like you to think about two things. First one, if you could locate yourself, which one do you use in your system? Because there is a high chance that you are using microservices, like everyone is moving to microservices. And this list is complete, so there's nothing more that you can use as caching. And the second thing that you, you, I would like you to think about is, does it make sense to change to any other from this in my system? So let's start. Like, why do we do caching? Generally, it's for two reasons. So the first one is the most obvious, to in improve the, the performance, to decrease the latency. Uh, so you did some calculation or some long time consuming operation once, you don't want to repeat it the same for the same parameters. Second one is resilience. This is a little less obvious, but you can think that even if your service is down, you can still provide the cached value, and sometimes it may be good enough for the user. It depends on the service, but for example, Amazon recommendation service, you can have the old recommendation not even knowing that the underlying service is down. How does it all look like in the microservice world? So this is like a classic microservice architecture. So we have some services, they are written in different programming languages, they have versions, they use each other, generally a MS. Now the question is, where is the right place to put your cache? Is it inside of the service or as a separate unit in our architecture, like a cache server, or should we put cache in front of the, each service? That is what, it, what this talk will be about. So the first caching pattern, the first caching tech topology is to use embedded cache. That is the simplest possible, the simplest possible thing you can, you can do. It looks as follows. So this is our system. A request goes to the load balancer. It's load balanced to one of the application web services. And then the, the application has a library. It uses the library for caching. It checks if such a request was already executed, if yes, Re return the cache value. If no, do some long-lasting business logic, put it into cache, and return the response. This long-lasting business logic, it can be anything, like a call to the database, it can be a call to the external service, whatever that is time-consuming. So this idea is so simple that you could even think about implementing this on your own. If you use Java, like if you are old, old guy still using Java, then you could write 
a code, something like that. It is exactly what I explained. So a request goes to, the, to our method. We check it if it is in the cache. If yes, return the, uh, the cache value. If no, do some processing, put it into cache, and return the response. So you can write it using concurrent hash map, but better not do it because concurrent hash map or any collection in your programming language is not a cache. It's not a cache because it has no eviction policies, no max size limit, no statistics, no built-in cache loaders, no expiration time, no notification mechanism. This is like all things that are missing from a simple collection. So we are way better off using some good library. What is a good library for Java? Guava, yes. Guava is a very good library for very simple caching where you can specify all these parameters I just mentioned and while creating the object, uh, while creating the cache. Another good library is ehcache. We could even think about moving this caching, caching <coughs> one layer higher to, and put it in the application framework. So if you use Spring, then with one keyword, you can add caching. So any call to this method will first check if the given ISBN is or, already in the book ca cache. If it is, it will return the cache value. If no, we will execute the method find book and slow source. Be careful with the Spring because Spring uses concurrent hash map by default. So you're better off while starting ca using caching, better off defining your own cache manager, for example, the Guava cache. So let's come back to this diagram. We have the first idea for caching, to use it embedded. But one of the problems is, is that request goes to load balancer, it goes to the web service on the top. We do long lasting processing, we put the value into the cache, return the response. Now, exactly the same request can go, can be load balanced to the, to the application on the bottom. And then we have to do it again because these caches are completely separated. So they don't know about each other. So one of the improvements to our embedded cache would be to use embedded distributed cache. It's still the same pattern in the term of the architecture, but this time we will use a different library we will use Hazelcast. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying it's all, I actually like, I try not to be vendor specific even though I work for Hazelcast, but if you use Java and use embedded caching, Hazelcast is actually the, really the best solution you can, you can have. Uh, so the idea is the same, request go to load balancer, go to the application, but this time the, all the caches, all embedded caches in all of our applications, they form one consistent cache cluster. So no matter to which cache you put your value, they are, they are, they are shared. How would it look like in our application? If we stick to Spring, it will look like this. So you don't have to define anything else than just use Hazelcast as a cache manager. I will show you a quick, very quick demo on how to use it, how it works in practice. So demo is, you know, the perfect failing demo. Nothing is better to wake up than a failing demo. <laughs> <laughs> so where is my IntelliJ? Okay, so I have like very simple Spring application which has actually nothing more than uh, than starting the cache, starting application and this cache configuration. And let me start this application. So if I start it, uh, then you obviously you have to be patient because it's Java, so it's like uh, um, it has some warm up time. Java is spring. So it started the first uh, first web application. If I start another one. Then, and I really defined nothing more than this, this line. They, 
they should join and form one consistent caching cluster. So here it means that they form one cluster. If I add more, then we'll join, they will all join the, the same cluster and form one distributed cache. So now there's a question to you. How did they discover themselves? Nazar, you cannot reply. <laughs> How did they discover themselves? Yeah, it's done. Yes, but they I started a completely separated application. Yeah, it, it happened inside here, but how is possible that Hazelcast found another Hazelcast? Yeah, it's actually, yes, multicast. It multicasted. I run both of them on my laptop, so they multicast and they discover themselves. T shirt. T shirt, yeah. <laughs> actually, yes, yes, I forgot about T shirt. Yes, can you pass? There is M and. Uh, yeah, do you want M or. L. Uh, ML. ML, okay. <laughs> Can you pass this? Thank you. So yes, they, it was simple because it was my laptop. However, like, you cannot use multicast everywhere. Uh, that is why, let me go back to our presentation. Hmm. Let me. Where is my presentation? Where is my cache? Uh, oh no. Uh, okay, I will, I will click by this. I oh, know maybe it's a bit faster. That is why. Mm, that is why, like, we had an idea that we will have a, an open. A, like plug, plug, plugins, like you can write your own plugin, and we also provide some for each environment. So they will automatically discover themselves in different environments. Like, if you know that your application will run on Kubernetes, you select, I would like to use Kubernetes plugin, and it will use the Kubernetes API to discover themselves. And the same with AWS and Others. So we wrote some of these plugins, some were written by the community. So actually, if you look at the all community plugins, there are much more. If your environment is super specific and you don't use AWS, you are, you don't use, uh, you're like really non-conformist in this world and you use some, your own solution, then you can always run Eureka and then you set up your serv Eureka service registry and then Hazelcast uses Eureka to discover themselves. I will not go to any details, but we publish a lot of blog posts on how to use each plugin. I mean, it's very simple, but how to, how to deploy in each environment, like for <coughs> Kubernetes, Eureka, and, uh, and much more. So we ended up like with such, such diagram for embedded distributed cache. Let's quickly look at, uh, on the pros and cons of embedded cache in general. From the good sides, like the configuration is super simple. Cache goes together with our application. So there's like no, no problem with deployment. We have low latency data access because you cannot do anything better than to have your cache inside your application in terms of latency. And you don't need any ops team needed to maintain the cache because, again, it goes together with your application. From the downsides, the management is not flexible. Imagine that you would like to scale up the cache because you need, uh, there is peak time, you need more memory. You can, use, you can do it only together with scaling your application. It's limited to JVM based. I mean, Hazelcast embedded is limited. For each programming language, you will find your own library for caching. But it will always be limited to your, to your uh, programming language that you chose for your application. And also from the downside, the data is collocated with the application, which may not sound like a big deal, but usually for big companies it is a big deal because, you know, big companies, big security restrictions and so on. The next 
architectural pattern, the next topology is client server. It looks as follows. Again, we go to request go to load balancer, it's forwarded to one of the application services. But now instead of using some library for internal caching, we use a the cache client library to connect to a server which is located somewhere. If you look at this diagram, there is there are like and compare it to the embedded mode, there are like two main differences. One is obviously we have a new thing on our architecture. And this new thing needs some, some people or some time to, to being managed. So we need some ops team or some DevOps effort, at least from the development team. But it's also good because we can uh, do some scaling, some management, like it's more flexible. The second thing that is very different from the embedded mode is that is this part. So now we use cache client to connect to cache server. This is good because we can, before we were like using Hazelcast, we were bound to Java. But here you can use any programming language you want because there is a well-defined protocol. So you just select the client for your programming language and that's all. And it's a very common strategy actually that for the microservices you set up a cache server and you have microservices that can be written in different programming language but they can still use this use cache. That is such a common approach that a lot of alternative solutions like Re the most popular Redis or used to be most popular memcached um, you can only use them in client-server mode because they are written, I guess Redis is written in C, so you cannot embed them easily in anything. So they only offer client-server mode. How to run it? If you, if you run Hazelcast to start the server, that we just have a script, you start it. If you are on the, in the modern Kubernetes world, we provide a Helm chart Helm chart is a package manager for Kubernetes. So with this one command, you set up the whole caching cluster. That is the code for the client. So this is what we would need to put in our Spring application, which will run in Kubernetes, so that client automatically discovers the server. And this part, get Kubernetes config set enabled true, that specifies use Kubernetes plugin for discovery. So it will automatically use Kubernetes API to discover where is, where is the server cluster. So as you see, like there is no static configuration here, which is good because Kubernetes and is, not, is not a well fit for any static configurations. So we ended up with a diagram like this. So we have this this server somewhere, someone needs to manage this. So if, it, if someone has to manage this, we can even move one step further and put this part into the cloud. Again, cloud is kind of client server. In terms of architecture, it's the same. However, the difference is that, uh, that the server part is somewhere in the cloud, is provided for us. So we don't have to do all this management stuff. Obviously, we have to pay for this. But don't worry, Hazelcast, Hazelcast Cloud, Nazar will show it, but if you register, you get some credits, but we also have some free, free clusters, like, uh, like all cloud things do, they go to AWS, you have the free, free clusters, like the small one, and we also have like uh, free uh, small Hazelcast clusters. How does it look like the configuration for application to connect to Hazelcast Cloud? This looks something like this. Nazar will show a demo of, of Hazelcast Cloud. In general, in general, we are very proud of this because we, we built it. This Hazelcast Cloud is our baby, so that's why we will show a lot of this. Um, but in general, you specify, there's no static configuration here. That is the important thing. You specify discovery token. So how to discover my cluster in the cloud, specify the cluster name and the password, so for the security, and that's all. 
This is also the way most cloud solutions work nowadays. You don't specify any IP addresses, but just have this discovery token. So we didn't invent this, we stolen this from other solutions. Pros and cons of the client server and cloud cache. From the, pro, from the good sides, data is finally separated from the applications, which is usually a must for big organizations. We have a separate management finally, so we can scale up. We, we would like to have not three nodes of cache or like three gigabytes, but suddenly we would like to have 15 gigabytes of cache. Then it, you can scale it up. You can, imp, you can even have auto scaling for the caching part. It's programming language agnostic, so we have this client server separation, so you can use any programming language you want. From the downsides, we need to, we need to manage this. There is a higher latency. Uh, when it was embedded, we didn't think about so much about latency. Even if it was embedded distributed, so there is network communication, but usually, usually it's a local network, so there is not much deal. However, like when you have a server, then you have to think where you set up your caching server. You cannot set up your caching server in Canada and connect from Lviv, because it will be super slow. And the same actually if you use the cloud solution. If you, when you create a cluster in Hazelcast Cloud, then you set up the region where the cluster should be created. It is created on you set up not only region, but you also set up the underlying cloud provider, because we don't provide infrastructure, we use AWS, GCP, or Azure. And, it's, and this is like done on purpose, because if you run your services on AWS, you would like to run your cache on AWS in the same region. And not only in the same region, what's more, we provide like a way to do a VPC peering so that your application and the cache that Hazelcast Cloud provides to you are really in the same network, or at least in the same virtual network. Because like we are here in the domain of in-memory data computing, which has really strict requirements in terms of latency. Those requirements are really more, more strict than for the databases. That's why you have to really think where your server is, even if you use a cloud solution. Okay, we covered like the easy part. So you may thought, why did I came here? It's, I already know this stuff. So now let's move to something new, because this is like embedded in the client server, it's kind of old things. However, like this sidecar caching is something completely new. And sidecar cache, caching is only for container-based environment. And this diagram is even only Kubernetes specific because Kubernetes, it has kind of win this war, you know, of the, what people will use for, to manage their containers. There was Docker Swarm, there were some other solutions, but now everybody is moving to Kubernetes or some system. So a short introduction on, to Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes, in Kubernetes, a deployment unit is called a pod. A pod can contain one or more containers. It usually contains just one container, which is your application. However, it can also has, have additional containers. For example, you could have an additional container like a logging agent, which will redirect your logs to some external system. And these additional containers are called sidecar container. Kubernetes guarantees that all containers in your pod are deployed on the same physical machine. That is very important. So with this introduction, we can go to this diagram. So diagram, again, request goes to our system. It goes to Kubernetes service. Kubernetes service is kind of a load balancer in the Kubernetes world. Then it's forwarded to one of the Kubernetes pod. The Kubernetes pod is received by the application. Application uses cache client to connect to cache server, but this cache server is located in the same pod, in the same, on the same physical machine. 
So the client actually can use always the local host to connect to the, to the cache server. Obviously, all these cache server, all these cache containers, they form one consistent distributed cache. So this solution is kind of a similar to both client server and embedded mode. It is similar to embedded mode because we, we are on the same physical machine to connect to the cache. We use the same resource pool. Application and cache, they use the same resource pool. And it scales up and down together with the application. However, it's also similar to client server because you can use different programming languages because after all you use a cl cache client to connect to, cache ser to, to this cache server. And there is some kind of isolation between the, of the data between client and between our application and the cache. The isolation is on the container level, which may be good enough or not good enough depending on your security restrictions. How does it look like in the code? We stick to this uh, Spring configuration. So we set up a static configuration to localhost, but even though the configuration is static, the whole system is dynamic because we just know that our sidecar cache is located on the same physical machine. That is the configuration for Kubernetes. So we specify in, the, in our deployment te template that pods should be created with two containers. <coughs> the first one is our application, our business logic. The second one is always the same, it is the cache server. Quick pros and cons of such solution. So the configuration is again simple. It's programming language agnostic. We have low latency. And there is some kind of isolation of data and applications. From the downsides, it's limited to container-based environment, but that's where world is going. That's the direction, so it's probably not a big deal. There is no flexible management again. We scale up, down, together with uh, application. And the data is collocated in the application pod. So it, again, maybe good enough, maybe not good enough for you. And the last architecture caching for today is something completely different. Because it's different because so far, application was always aware that such thing as a cache exists. So it was application that connected to the cache. In the reverse proxy pattern, in the reverse proxy topology, we'll put cache in front of our application. So it will look like this. A request goes to our system, it goes to the load balancer, and now just before the load balancer or just after the load balancer, there is a caching on, on the protocol level. And then only if the request is not found in the cache, it's forwarded to the application. So application does not even know that cache exists. A good solution for this is Nginx, because Nginx is used everywhere, so you can be sure that if there were bugs, they were already found, so maybe you will not be the first one who, who finds the bug. You can configure caching in, in uh, Nginx with, with this configuration. Obviously, there, there is more if you want, but just by adding this, Nginx will cache, uh, will cache your requests. Now, Nginx is, I mean, it's good in general, but it has some, it has some problems. One of them is, um, you see like the, you specify the, the path to your file system. And that is, obviously the Nginx does not write to the file system all the time. It stores data in memory. However, it offloads what is not fit to the file system. This is good and bad. I mean, it's, it's good because it does not evict your data so fast, but if you think like Hazelcast, Hazelcast does not even have an option to offload your data to, to the file, file system. And it's that done on purpose. Because use, use Hazelcast, you are sure that your data is memory. You are sure that it is very fast. Here you are not sure because it may be on file system, may be in memory. But that, that is not the only problem. That is, is, is still fine. The other problems for Nginx is that um, it's only for HTTP, but it's okay as well. But it's not distributed, it's not highly available. And that is 
that is a bigger issue. You can use Nginx with some, uh, with some plugins, with some modules. However, like for Hazelcast, it doesn't exist yet. And for Redis, it exists, but it's not very mature. So you, you could try it, but um, it's not very well adopted yet. But one of the ideas that we can um, even go further with this and co combine two caching patterns is to use this reverse proxy as a sidecar. And that will be the last, last uh, pattern I present. So the idea is that we are again, we are sidecar, we, are, we will limit ourselves to the Kubernetes environment. And the idea is like this. Request goes to our Kubernetes service, which load balances the traffic to, to the Kubernetes pod. But this time in the Kubernetes pod, it's not the but it's the reverse proxy, what I called reverse proxy cache container. And only if the request is not found, it's forwarded to the application container. So, you know, this idea that your cache is in front of application, it's, it's a good and bad. It has some good sides and bad sides. Starting from the good sides, and the reason why we will use it is we need to go back to the first diagram from this presentation. So a classic microservice system, different services, different versions, different programming languages, they use each other. And you can look at the architecture like this and say, I would like to inject caching in this service and this service. So you don't even need to change the code of your service or the code of your application or you don't need to build new images or whatever to introduce caching to make some performance improvement to your system. So it's all done on the declarative manner in the configuration. And the Kubernetes will look like this. This time starting from the bottom. We have two containers, the one in container. The, the container at the bottom, this is our application, this do does not change. Then we have this caching proxy container, which is, cache, which is kind of interceptor of the traffic together with the cache server. And the, we, have also, we need also an init container. So the init container is the container that is run, that is, it's some code that is run in before any of these two starts. Because like normally, if we do a deployment without this, it would be the application that will receive the request because the, it is the application that has this port open. But we need to tweak it, like to have all the external traffic on let's say port 80 to go not to the application, but go to the, our reverse proxy container <coughs> and all the internal traffic on the same port go to the application container. And this tweak, this, it looks, it is, a very simple script just to change the IP, IP tables in our uh, pod. If we, if we look at this diagram again, and this idea that the cache is injected, you may think of something like an Istio or service mesh. So the idea is actually very similar. The Istio is the system that Make, make it possible for you to inject some networking rules in a declarative manner. In Istio, you can specify that I would like 10% of my traffic product page to go to the reviewer one and 90% to the reviewer three. And for this, you don't have to change any of the code of the services. So Istio is about traffic control. Istio is about security. So again, you can add, without changing your service, you can add security level by injecting this. And so this caching injection is actually a well fit to, Istio is a big thing. I mean, it's, it's like, it's moving very quickly. You can already deploy a cluster together with Istio, Kubernetes cluster together with Istio on Google Cloud just by ticking a checkbox. So there, it's very well integrated. And they actually plan to, in, to, to uh, have caching solution to add a possibility to add caching uh, in Istio. 
And I have an open GitHub issue, which may not sound promising because it's an open, just an open issue from 2017. However, they are working actively on this. There are open PRs, so they, it will soon be available on Istio. So this whole idea of reverse proxy caching will become a big thing while it's implemented in Istio. Because people are already using Istio in production. Service mesh is, is a big thing. People are talking about it. People are using this. So as soon as they, they do support for caching, this reverse proxy uh, sidecar pattern, because Istio is, after all, it's a sidecar idea, this will become a bit, big thing. But I mentioned to you that this idea that we put cache in front of application, the application does not know about caching, it also has some bad sides. So if you detach the cache per application, there is one thing that becomes more difficult, and that is cache invalidation. So if you look anywhere on the internet, what is the problem with the caching is, is the cache invalidation, meaning when to decide that my data in the cache is already old. I should not use it. I should go directly to the service or directly to the database. If application is aware that the cache exists, it can have some business logic. Like in Spring, you will have cache evict and have some, have some business logic to say, this data is not valid anymore. However, like if we put cache in front of the application, that we are uh, limited to, uh, to, to like timeouts basically. I, I, anything that HTTP provides, but basically some, like some ETACs and so on, but basically it's, 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 we will set the timeouts. So this reverse proxy is, it has some very good size, but also it is limited to some, uh, to some use cases. A quick summary of reverse proxy and reverse pro proxy sidecar caching. So the, big, the biggest advantage, the reason why you will use it is it's configuration based, it's declarative. It's also programming language agnostic, it's everything agnostic, you don't even touch the code. It's very consistent with the containers world and microservice world, meaning that when Istio implements it, and th that's the direction that it's going. Like, so in a, I think in a few years, that's, that will be a normal way of doing caching in a microservice system. From the downsides, it's, cache invalidation is difficult. There's no major solution yet, meaning we did a prototype in Hazel, Hazelcast, but it is very prototype, so you can play with this, but not use it in production, at least. And, the, when Istio implements it, it will be probably become, a, after some part, a major solution. And it's protocol-based, which is probably not a problem because we all, we are HTTP world now, you know, everybody uses only HTTP. That was the last pattern. So as a quick summary, uh, what I propose is, I will not repeat any of this pattern because that could be boring. So I propose I, I prepared a very short decision tree, which can help you say which, which topology do I need for my system. It's very oversimplified, but let's try. While choosing the caching solution is, does my application need to be aware of the caching? If no, do I run in container-based environment? If no, you can use reverse proxy. If it's container-based, you can use reverse proxy sidecar as soon as this matrix solution exists. However, if your application needs to be aware of the caching, then the next question is, do I have a lot of data or do I have some security restrictions? If no, is, does it need to be language agnostic or is it container-based? If no, use embedded or embedded distributed cache. If yes, use sidecar. If you work in a big organization or you have a lot of data in your system, then the last question you have to ask, is my deployment now a cloud? If no, use on-premise client server. If yes, use some cloud solution. As I said, it's oversimplified, but at least give the direction where to go and where, where to look for. So as the last slide for this presentation, I just propose a few resources. The first one is our, um, our blog post about how to set up Hazelcast as a sidecar. 
uh, as a sidecar caching. Second one is this reverse proxy sidecar caching prototype from us again. Third one is uh, caching best practices. It is um, a very good blog post, not strictly related to, uh, to this talk, but it's about, in general about caching, but it's a ver very good, that, that's why I put it here. And the last one is a very good video talk about Nginx as a reverse proxy caching, how to set it up, what are the, um, what are the good and bad sides. So with this last slide, I would like to thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Yes, questions? Uh, have you ever considered to mix uh, Sidecar and Cloud? Sidecar, but in... For, for, for example, if you, mm -hmm. have, uh, if you have an application that uh, has a uh, long computing uh, result, mm -hmm. and uh, the ports are starting to open it. So, and uh, when the new port is created, the computing should be uh, maintained again. But uh, with this uh, mixed approach, we could store long-term uh, results in the cloud and uh, mm -hmm. in the sidecar. Yes, what you're saying is like, um, um, if I understand correctly, is that, uh, yes, a kind of, an, not much to but a different like level of caching. Mm -hmm. So we have like the first level kind of the, that is near yep. you, and then the second level uh, that is like somewhere in the cloud. So before uh, in a port application, I would ask uh, Cloud Server if there is a uh, well result, actual result. Yeah, we don't do something like this. I'm not sure if it's a good solution, because like, the problem is the caching is like that um, multi-level caching is usually very complex. It, it, it looks very simple, but it's very soon when you don't know where your data is, where it's taken from. I'm not saying that people don't use it. Uh, I mean, in a, if you use Hibernate, I mean, you have this level caching, it's fine. But when you have like a lot of like layers of the external caching, I, I would, I, I don't, I, I don't, no, it's a good solution. I, I would have to think about it like the very specific, but I would be very, um, there's like very good rule to cache only in one place, mm -hmm. not to cache in many places, because there is, then you, yeah, as I said, like you don't know where your value really is, and it becomes very complicated to analyze the system. Yeah. Yes? Is there a possibility to discover uh, each other uh, different uh, Yes, yes, yes. They they always discover like themselves. Uh, maybe I didn't stress it enough, but um, let me just in any of the solution. Oh, okay, this decision tree. <laughs> Step back. Yes, it any uh, no matter which. Um, yes, I thought it would be. Easy. <laughs> Wait for this. <laughs> okay, in any. Yeah, yeah, okay, I clicked it too much and, okay, 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 I will explain, <laughs> probably we'll move to the beginning of the present, okay, yes, stopped. Um, so in any of these solutions, always the, uh, this is in a different pod and it discovers, the, the caches themselves, they discover themselves automatically. So we can add just additional Kubernetes pod without application container, just uh, cache container, right? And it will discover each, each other. Yeah, discover is not a problem. It will always discover themselves, yeah. Uh, we can scale in some, somehow we can scale. Ah, ah you, you yeah. That we cannot scale in the uh, downside. Ah, you mean that you could add more pods, but only with the cache container? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you could you can do it technically, no problem. I would again like the it makes your thing more complex. So you you need to think like what is the benefit of making thing more yeah, complex? You, uh, you stress that it's downside. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. And technically, by the way, you should add uh, all uh, all uh, uh, downsides from the sidecar mm -hmm. to the proxy sidecar. Yes. Um, yes, technically, you could mix this, mix this, but I would never recommend it. Yes, technically, it's not a problem, but I would. Yes, yes, technically, it's not a problem because they are. Yeah, you could, you can add, you can even mix it more. I mean, to have you know some really strange topology. Yes. I have a question about consensus algorithms. So, is it the same for embedded solution and for cloud solution? 
for example, mm -hmm. if multiple threads or multiple connections trying to acquire the same log. Mm -hmm. Is it work similar? Uh, yes, the consensus is the same, the algorithm. But one thing that is important here is Hazelcast is, um, yeah, OK, let, let's start from the beginning. Hazelcast is, uh, it, it, it is strict, strictly consistent, meaning you put the data, you are sure it's there. However, if there is a partitioning, like um, there is some network partitioning, and your this is broken, then it, and then it, you will have there will be you will have a split brain, it will, and it will still work. Distributed log it's a problem. However, recently our uh, colleague added uh, added a feature called Hazelcast CP subsystem, which is rough implementation of Hazelcast. So you can take like kind of from Hazelcast take uh, in Java you just take an object. Which is, uh, and then you have this consensus thing. When your caster breaks, okay, you are sure that. Like option, yeah? <coughs> yes. 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 It's not. If you use just for cache, like for caching or uh, like no, the no. distributed map. I, I won't. No, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like again, like it's uh, it's an option. You have to get it to to like use for the distributed locking or like this. Otherwise, if you have network partitioning, you may end up with two logs, which you don't want. Some people use, still use it because they say, okay, it's, it's not that, that log is not that important for us. So some people are using that, but uh, in, you cannot consider this a like, really distributed log by default. But if you take this option, which is also an open source, then, then yes, then you can use it this way. <laughs> yeah, I forgot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we get this question all the time. <laughs> I'm yeah, I'm a developer, so I, I will not like try to I, <laughs> sell it. This, Redis is a good solution. I, I'll tell you like why people use Hazelcast. Is like one thing is super well integrated in Java. If you are a Java developer, you will like it. This is like, it's just one thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can you can use it because you have clients in different languages. But I, I will tell you just just to finish this uh, because I started like so. One one thing is like people use if they are Java developers, they prefer Hazelcast because it's super well integrated. And the second thing is like Hazelcast is distributed from the day one. It was built and distributed in mind. So each of these guys they are the same. They just store there. There is data partitioning, but they are the same in this system. Redis is kind of a master slave architecture when you can only read from the slaves. So it's like because you really feel well in Kubernetes. So people are, uh, I can tell only about feedback. Like people saying like, okay, Hazelcast is super nice with Kubernetes because it literally fits the idea of the distributed system. But again, I will not tell you that Redis is a bad solution because there are so many people using this and uh, it's good, I mean. It's Feature-wise, we have more features because, mm -hmm. uh, like, if Kubernetes uh, red does, then Kubernetes doesn't have to Yeah, another is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, it's true. Redis also managed to cloud, because Kubernetes is also cross-minded, so, and if you take open-source Hazelcast, you can also cross it in your cloud and in the US. Yeah, yeah. And like the, the ideas, it's the same idea. Redis is open source, you can use it. Hazelcast is open source, you can use it. We have a cloud version. Uh, Redis has Redis Labs, cloud version the same. You have, you have some free, uh, uh, free <coughs> clusters, but you have to pay after all if you want. And so the, the, in terms of the money, it's, it's the same. Yes? Uh, question about the Rails cross. Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. uh, can you maybe give some simplified, uh, simplified version to 
Because you didn't say that it, it, it's impossible, you said that it's hard. <laughs> uh, can you give at least some simplified version how we can invalidate the, mm -hmm. the reverse proxy before the CTL expires? Yeah. <laughs> You can you can make a, I know you can make a REST call for example in Hazelcast you can make just a REST call to evict the data, invalidate it. But it, it will like it will break the whole idea. I mean it's technically possible. It's no problem. You could make application that make REST calls to the cache, but then it breaks the whole idea of why you introduce this. You introduce it for the reason that application should not think about it. So that that is like my point. So that maybe that I said it's hard because technically it's possible. Can just make a REST call or, or potentially yeah. this solution is like uh, the best for where, where like it's not very important that you, you have in invalid data application mm -hmm. return it for some time. Yes, and there are uh, yes, it may sound like um, yeah, there are not so, no no such cases. However, you know we, we all use browsers and we all use caching like this there. So it's like I think there there are. More cases that fit this, like than than uh, than we may think, in the sense that um, maybe it will not be fit for a database which you need uh, some uh, strict consistency. But maybe like somewhere when you have eventual consistency anyway, maybe you can be prepared for the data that is not good. Do we have any other questions? No questions. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Yes.